God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well hi there and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk And Alice and I want to greet you in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen, yes Amen uh, we're here in Tuscany, in Italy, in the village of Mantecatini Terme. Hey. Hey. Uh, so it, it's been a blessed time so far, and we're just glad that we can have the, the whole, little hotel we're staying in allow us to use this little room in the basement to do this filming. Yes. Unfortunately, there's not much light in this little room, but we'll see. We'll see how we make out. As long as you can hear the word. Yeah, well, the thing is, I know that the Word of God can penetrate darkness, so hallelujah. We're continuing on in our study of the letters to the seven churches of Revelation, and we are in, we're continuing our look at the church of Thyatira, the letter to the church of Thyatira. And we left off in the end of verse 24 uh, in our last session. I, I'd like Alice to read that, that verse. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. That's it. Well, Father, we just thank you that we can come together. Yes. That we can get into your word here, Lord God. Especially in this place, in this land, Lord. And we just ask for your touch, your, your presence, your anointing upon your word as we go to see your son Jesus Christ more and more clearly. That's our desire. We might be more and more like him. So we just ask you to bless this time, Father, in the name of your son Jesus Christ. Alrighty. Alrighty. We were talking about, when we talked about the deep things of Satan in our last session, which is available on the website still, will be, uh, talking about maturity. Not knowing the deep things of Satan, but we are to know the depths of God. Yes. And that's about maturity. So I said at the end of that, that uh, we would we'll talk a little bit more about this because it truly is important, right? Think about this. The Apostle Paul wrote in the first letter to the, the church of Corinth. And remember, this is a church that God had used him to start and to grow, and he was the first pastor, and I, he's, I think he's about a year and a half there. But when he wrote back to them, here's what he said, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. 1 Corinthians 3, verses one and two. So he's saying, you know, that the childishness is immaturity, right? Now maturity, I, since we started this, I've asked a number of people, I thought it was just interesting, you know, define maturity. I, even, I went to the dictionary and I looked at the word maturity and it says to be mature. Mm -hmm. That's a big help. Uh, and with all the people, I mean, they didn't have a clear idea of how do you define maturity. And typically, I think the, the world thinks of it purely as an aging process, okay? Now that, that's not far off, but it's not just a matter of time, because I know a lot of older people, Christians, who are very immature. Very immature. Mm -hmm. Now Paul is writing to these Christians, and these are Christians who have been Christian for some time, and he's saying you're children, you're still children, you should not be, but you are. So how do we define maturity? I think a reasonable way to start is by saying, well, it's the opposite of childishness. Okay. All right? If you can't put an age on it, if you can't put a year on it, whether you know some people think, well, it's, you know, it's 21 you to become mature. Oh my goodness gracious. Have a look around you and see how many immature 21-year-olds there are out there today. And as I said, I know a lot of older people been saved a long time, and yet they still seem to be immature. So if we start with the concept of maturity being the opposite of being childish, 
and I, I think that's reasonable. Then think about the things that Paul says demonstrate the traits, the characteristics of childishness. Okay? He says, still in 1 Corinthians, but in the 13th chapter, he says to them, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Okay? So there's a difference between being a man, mature, and being a child, immature. The, now, remember it says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Yes. So childishness is foolishness. And if there's one thing that we don't need to be as Christians, it's to be foolish, all right? But what he said here was, the way one speaks, the way a person thinks, and the way one reasons, that's what he said, demonstrates, you know, that move from childishness to maturity, right? Now, God is not a God of confusion. He is a God of good order. Note the order that the Spirit of God moved Paul to write these things. Speaking, thinking, and reasoning. Now, if I ask you, and be, be honest out there, do you not agree? Would you not agree with this statement? You better think before you speak. I didn't get a non She knows the answer to that. Yes. Well, the world has trained you, and not without, not without some reason. You better think before you speak. And yet here, the Spirit of God is saying, no, you better speak, then think, then reason. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Which is good proof that his ways are still not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. When I, when I first saw this, it, I mean, it just really struck me, and it seems strange that the Spirit would move Paul to put speaking before thinking. All right? But then... You know, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. Let's look at another scripture. This is from the Apostle James. He said, So, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. He puts the hearing before the speaking. The Lord's teaching is that we are not to think before we speak. The Lord's command, his teaching, is that we are to hear before we speak. Like him, we were supposed to be in the name. Jesus said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So what Jesus is saying is, he didn't say anything until he heard from the Father. So he heard, before he spoke. Because you see, when you think, you're, well, if you're leaning on your own understanding, which it says in Proverbs 3, don't you do this, right? You've got to hear God before you open your mouth. All too many Christians have not achieved any maturity in their walk with the Lord, in spite of how long they may have been saved. They're thinking, leaning on their own understanding, to form the words that they will speak too often from their own wisdom. So, let's listen to him, right? Because then God speaks through the Apostle Peter to say, whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. 1 Peter 4, 11. Well, how are you going to speak what, uh, like the utterances of God if you haven't heard the word of God? You haven't heard from him, all right? So, Paul, whom we are to imitate as he imitated Jesus, that's what he said in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom. How are you going to speak God's wisdom if you're not having heard it? Okay? You have to hear before you speak. And when you do this, it will change your thinking. Once you change your thinking, it will change the way you reason things. Okay? Jesus is the utterance of God. 
He is the Word. Jesus is the wisdom of God. That's why Paul said, For I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is maturity. That is knowing the depths of God that make foolish the deep things of Satan. Think about the logic of this, okay? The logic is, faith comes by hearing. Right? Well, if faith comes by hearing, and you act or speak or do anything before you have heard, well, you're not, you're not doing or speaking in faith. Is that logical? Right? Yeah. But anything not done in faith is sin. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you're out there speaking, and it's not based on what you have heard, then it's not based on faith. Now, when I say hearing, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a booming voice coming out of the ceiling. If you are in the Word, being led by the Spirit of God in the Word, well, that's hearing from God. He's speaking. He's speaking to you. God is speaking to you through His Word. He can speak to you in many ways, right? But He speaks to us through His Son. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. He speaks to them. Wisdom stands in the street and shouts. The Lord roars from Zion. God is speaking. Let him who has ears hear. How many times has he said that in these letters to the churches? Right. So you have to hear from God in order to have faith. Now, you know, if you speak without hearing, where are you speaking from? You're speaking from your own mind. Right? If you speak from faith, because you see it says in Romans 10, with the heart man believes. So when you hear from God, it builds, it builds belief, faith in your heart. And then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you're speaking words of faith, words of life. That's maturity. That's maturity, is to know that you have, you, and this is, this is humility. This is submission to God, is to understand that you're not capable. You are not capable of bringing words of life into this darkness of this world unless you are taking what you have heard from God and speaking those, repeating those things. That's right. We are, as the word clearly says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors can't go to a foreign country and speak what they want to say. They speak what they have heard from the government because they represent that government. This is really important because in these last days, we need that maturity. We need not to be childish. Because think about the traits of childishness. It's impatience, selfishness. All the things that are the opposite are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So if, if you're being immature and you're being childish, I promise you, you will discredit the kingdom of God. You will do yourself no good. And you will not bring blessing to the people who are hearing what you have to say. I know, that, that seems rather important to me in this day and age. All right. yeah, there's so much bad news out there, they have to hear some good news. Eternal good news. Eternal good news, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're here in Italy and we were having breakfast this morning with a couple from the UK. And it's like, you know, the, the, the woman was saying over and over again how there's so much bad news. You turn out, you don't, they don't hear it. Where we are in Italy, you can only get one channel on the television, and that's BBC World News. And all you see is Ebola, terrorism, strife, conflict. Uh, and, and it was all like she was getting depressed about it. Mm. Well, fortunately, we were there to bring some good news into her life. But it's true. We have the words of life because the Lord has entrusted us with them. How precious is that? You remember in John chapter 6 when many of Jesus' disciples were walking away from him because they said his word was too difficult. He turns to his apostles and he said, what about you? I mean, he, that's you blunt. Me too? That's blunt. Mm -hmm. Are you too, yeah, you're going to walk away. And Peter said, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Well, those words of eternal life, God has now entrusted to you because he will speak them to you and you have the power to repeat them, to bring them, like an ambassador, 
not like an ambassador, as an ambassador, to bring those words into the lives of other people. These are days that call for maturity, spiritual maturity. And then in Revelation 2, verse 25, the Lord says to the church, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. What you have, hold fast. What do they have that the Lord wants them to hold fast to? Stuff? Well, in true Hebrew fashion, let's start from the back and go forward, all right? I think that's a good idea. Uh, so then, none of you can be my disciples, Jesus said, who does not give up all his own possessions. Luke 14, 33. So obviously, this is not about holding on to material things, possessions. What the Lord saw as valuable in the lives of the believers in this church were love, faith, service, perseverance, and the deeds that those things led to, just as he had said in the opening of the letter, right back in verse 19. Those are the things we're hold fast to. Those are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Don't lose your fruits. With that being said, it becomes ever more important to remember that Jesus also said that Satan comes as a thief to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take. Jesus is saying, hold on to these things. Because Satan will come and try and steal them from you. Be on guard. For your adversary, the devil, comes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom they may devour. You've got to be on guard. You have to guard what has been entrusted to you. Now what Paul said to Timothy? Amen. Yes, So, now, how will Satan try and steal the things that are precious that God has given you? How will he try and steal them? The only tool he has, because it says he's been disarmed, right? When Jesus Christ was publicly displayed on that cross, showing forth the love of the Father, Satan at that time was publicly displayed as being disarmed. So the only tool that he has, the tool of his trade, is a lying tongue. And he is a liar and the father of lies. Exactly what Jesus said in John chapter 8. But he uses his minions, his nasty little minions, to do the work. Again, let me go back to this time of 2 Corinthians. Paul said, therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. 2 Corinthians 11, 15. Hello, Jezebel. Remember Jezebel. Remember Jezebel here in this letter. And Jesus said, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, because she was literally a minion of the devil. Come disguised as a servant of righteousness. A counterfeit, right? But the purpose was, she was there because Satan had sent her. Now, that doesn't mean she got you know a letter saying, here, I want you to go here. But people who are not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ are in bondage absolute bondage to the devil. That's what the Word of God says. You are enslaved to that. You are either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. So in fact, however, however it occurred, Satan had sent Jezebel into that church to steal from the saints, to steal their love of the Lord, to steal their, their peace, to steal their joy. Okay? Tolerating her in the church was an act of tolerating the devil in the church. You've got to understand that. She was there to steal and destroy the love, faith, and service, and perseverance, the deeds that led to these things. This is what we talk about the things that the Lord was saying, hold on to, hold fast to. It's no light thing to allow false teachers to minister to the body. And yet, it would seem today that we take it very, very lightly. We're tolerating quite a bit. Tolerating quite a bit. And you, and you don't seem to get it. I mean, people can make mistakes. Praise God. I, I need grace from you. I mean, you know, as, as we sit here, that was one of the first discoveries I made on the day that I got saved. From Scripture, I realized that no, the Pope is not infallible. Yo, I say that here in Italy. Yes. Shall, I, shall I look around? And uh, 
just as clearly the Lord showed me that neither am I. You want infallibility, look to the Lord. Okay? That's the only place you're going to find it. So yes, we all make mistakes. So what's your fault? Yeah. But so you have a situation when somebody makes a mistake, they can there it's either one of two things. They're a brother or sister in error who need to be gender corrected. That's one option. There's only one other option. And that other option is there are many. A disciple. They a are counterfeit. Sent of the devil. Sent. And this is what Jesus. One other, I don't understand this subjects a lot of people. I, I don't understand it from just from my experience, although I've had the experience. I understand it from the Word of God. Because when Jesus said to the religious teachers of Jerusalem, you, you know, who, who, ones he called snakes and vipers, right. he said, you are of your father the devil. That's right. That did not sit well with them. But you're either serving one or serving the other. You're always serving somebody. I promise you that. So we need to either, if, if it's a brother in error, we need to go to them. Go to them alone. And with the word of God, which Paul wrote to Timothy and said it's profitable for correction, right? For training in righteousness, for reproof. Go to them with the word and show them in the word their error. But if it's not a brother in, in error, then it is an emissary of the devil come to steal. I mean, this is part of the role of, a, of, of the pastoral role in the church, the shepherds. One of the roles of a shepherd is to protect the flock. And yet, it's like nobody wants to say anything because, oh, no, that's judgment. No, it's not judgment. It's being a faithful, it's being a faithful steward. It's being a faithful shepherd. Uh, you know what? Get out your little Bible and go through the Old Testament. Go read Isaiah. Go read Ezekiel. Go read Jeremiah. And see, and woe to the shepherds of Israel. Okay, these are those days, I promise you. Don't tolerate error or sin starting in your own life. And then Jesus said, until I come. You know, I'm a lot here in, in Corinthians, but in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said to the church, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. When you hear that, you know, I, I, I know I've shared this, and this is, uh, I was going to say it's silly, it's not silly at all. Just when I was praying one day, a few years ago, it just came to me, it was like I had this vision of, of the Father, and Jesus didn't see that, I didn't see the Father. I would have blown up and wouldn't be here with you today. Um, but it was just like, here are the saints going on before us, and all the angels that are there. And... Jesus doesn't even know the time of day. So I certainly am not going to make projections. Everybody who has has failed. But there will come a time, guaranteed, there will come a time, there will come a point in time where God the Father will turn to his son, Jesus Christ, and say, get the horse ready. It's time. I don't believe that's the time as far off. But you know what? Whether it's, whether it's, Today, tomorrow, of a hundred years from now, Jesus is coming back. That's why he says, hold fast until I come. You know, I mentioned that we were here and we were talking to this uh, British couple. We were having a, a meal with them. And she was talking about the bad news. And I said, well, that's just a sign of the times. And we got into this little conversation about, okay, what, what times? I said, the times of the last days, the perilous last days. And while she knows virtually nothing about scriptures, and, and that's being generous, you know, she went on to say, well, it's kind of always been this way. And it's, it struck me so much because, you know, well, let me read what Peter said. And I'm going to take the time to read this whole thing from 2 Peter. If you have your Bible, by the way, take notes. If you don't have a Bible with you, or, and test the things that I say. When I, when I say, it, like, I'm going to read this, but you need to go read it. You need to hear it from God. Um, you need to hear from the Lord before you either speak or act. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. 
Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. It's always been this way. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct, conduct and godliness? What kind of people are we supposed to be? Mature. We are supposed to be holy and mature. You know, I, I did a teaching not long ago in Oldham in England, just uh, talking about, want to hear a heresy? Want to hear an untruth? You know, the, you know the account of the Good Samaritan? He wasn't. That's right. He wasn't. It says that there's none good, not even one. Not that Samaritan. You can do good deeds, but you can't be good. And God doesn't call us to be good. He calls us to do good. But he doesn't call us to be good. He calls us to be holy. Holy and mature, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what Peter says a few verses on. Growing is maturing. That's right. We need that maturity. We need to grow as Christians. You can't do that because if you don't grow, you're either going to go backwards or you're going to be so still. Stagnant. You'll get stagnant. Mm -hmm. And it says in Zephaniah that God will come, He will search, and He will punish those who are stagnant in spirit. Because, you know. Alice and I have been blessed to spend time and we lived in the, in the jungle, in the bush in Central America. We traveled in East and West Africa and been out in the bush. Water is one, probably the single most precious thing. Okay? And you, you come upon fresh water, flowing water, it's great, it's wonderful. I mean, oh, it's wonderful. But you come across green, still, scummy water, it's, it's good for nothing. It's smelly too. Yeah, it is. It is stinky. It's got to move. What God pours into you has to flow out through you to touch other lives. It, otherwise, it'll become stagnant. You need to hear from God, but having heard, you need to speak. That's right. What you hear. Right? When we start this, and you know, I mentioned Romans 8, you, know, you believe in your heart. Well, it says, you know, you believe in your heart, resulting in salvation. You confess. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. It's got to flow through you. The Word of God, what you're hearing now, if you're hearing it, I pray that you speak to the Father about it, that you hear from Him. Test and when God speaks into you, you would speak out to others. It's got to flow through you. Otherwise, it'll become and it'll, it'll become stagnant, and you'll not grow. Okay? And then, once having spoken it, since the tongue is like a rudder that steers the ship, you need to act upon that word. You need to start to reason with that transformed mind that came from the belief in your heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and act upon the Word of God. Because otherwise, you're ineffective. Otherwise, you're nothing. I mean, you know, it's, these are the things. We are called to be doers of the Word, not just hearers of the Word. That's why, you know, I, I, I know, and this is basically between me and God, I have faith. I live in God. I was giving each of us a measure of faith. You know, and, uh, people talk to us, you know, we're missionaries, we travel constantly. And we say, we do it by faith. We don't have, 
We don't have resources. We don't have you know very very minimal resources. So we do what we do by faith. Well, if you do anything, it's not by faith. You're sinning. If you're a plumber back there, or a carpenter, or a baker, or a candlestick maker, you better be doing it by faith. Okay. So we have to get to that point where all we're doing is by faith. But, but the simple fact, truth of the matter is, I said I have faith. Yes. Where is it? Can you see it? No, you can't. And this is why James, who was in perfect harmony with Paul, said, "You show me your faith, right? I'll show you my works." Because. Faith without works is dead, being by itself. So you, if you have faith, it had better result in works. Works that you do, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that men will see and glorify God, not glorify you. God's got to get the glory. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this right here. But I do want to say, uh, I'm taking my chances on upsetting you. We spent time yesterday in Pisa, and and prior to that, Luca, and, and then we were over in Florence and Siena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you go here, there are massive, massive cathedrals. I don't know if you know. I, I was surprised to find that the very few people that I talked to actually knew the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which took two hundred years to build. Is nothing more than a bell tower for the massive cathedral next to it. And when we went there, which doesn't please my spirit, I see literally thousands of tourists, and they're all there trying to get pictures of the Leaning Tower. I didn't see one fall on his face and glorify God because of that building. I didn't see one fall to the ground in awe of God and, and get saved. They see the glory of man. They see what man has accomplished, and they give credit to man. That does man no good, it does them no good, and it doesn't honor God. They have to see God working through you. And he builds, doesn't take him 200 years to build a bell tower, he's building a church. That's what, that's what he's building, not a cathedral, not a massive building, he's building a living church. Which is what we are. Living stones. And he's building it out of living stones. He said, I will build my church. Take the faith that God has implanted in you. Let it grow. Let it spring to life. Let it mature. Walk in the power of God's love. Listening to his voice and acting on what you hear. Acting on what you hear. I promise that God will work through you in a way that will touch the lives of people around you. That's my promise to you. You know why it's my promise to you? Because it's God's promise. It's God's promise to all of us. And He watches over His word to perform. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that your word has that power. That when you send your word forth, it never returns without accomplishing your purpose, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, that you would open the ears, dig out our ears, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord God, that we would clearly hear your voice, see the wondrous glory of your word, Lord. And that we would start more and more maturing, desiring, not like a child, always selfish and impatient, Lord God, but with that patience of the Spirit, Lord God, that we would be desiring to grow into that mature man, that mature woman. Lord, that would be useful to you. Lord, we thank you that you still choose the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise, that you can choose to use us in our weakness, that your strength might be displayed. For truly, your grace is sufficient. So, Father, I pray that you bless Alice and I and every person that hears this study, Lord God, and that it would make a difference, that it would cause us to grow, and that we would go forth, Lord God walking in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us. Yes. We're just always blessed to be able to do this as we travel. Sometimes it's a little less easy than other times, but God is able. Amen. Amen.
So, until next time, I know that Alice wants to tell you once again, Jesus loves you. A lot. So be with us again next time. Until then, be used for the glory of His name. God bless you and goodbye.